sweltering 34 degrees centigrade mm -hmm. and so <laughs> I'm very happy to be in the cold and just let my nose get a little colder. Uh, but that's what is interesting about places, they're particular, we make meaning out of them. And uh, when I did my philosophy, interdisciplinary philosophy, humanities on environmental philosophy, when I started out there was hardly anything about nature in Indian thought. And so my work is pioneer work, and pioneer work is often raw and rough at the edges, and it's going to take me a lifetime to put uh, more and more polish into it. But so this is all a work in progress, and I find more and more place a very central category to my thinking, not only from place studies perspectives of uh, Western philosophical thought, but place particularly from Indian uh, thought, which has picked particular terms, and I'll come to that a little while later. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me go into this. I'll speak for about 30 to 40 minutes and then I'll open up uh, it for discussion. And uh, if 
I'm going to be using some of some Sanskrit words. Um, they're not, I hope they're not too confusing, but they'll be a, I'll explain them in English as I go along. I'm not going to throw verses at you, uh, pundit style, but some of them are concepts uh, which are necessary to understand because it says nature in Indian thought, and a la large part of Indian thought is unfortunately or fortunately in Sanskrit. Okay. Uh, uh, nature in India has been conceptualized as sacred, both within the mainstream Hindu religious tradition, which we all know about, as well as other belief systems of communities, including those called Adivasis or the tribal cultures. The presupposition that nature and natural objects have sacred meanings for such communities can be inferred from the practices of reverence of nature, such as ritual worship, and popular narratives about nature where it is called sacred. These references or practices are embedded in the everyday lives of people. Uh, they are overtly expressed in the form of some ritual, worship, or daily practice, but they are also supported by narratives and stories. A daily form of worship by the South Indian woman is drawing beautiful patterns of rice powder on the floor of her house, just outside uh, her main gate, or worship of a tree, worship of water and tanks, demarcation of sacred groves. These are some of the practices that people in India follow on an everyday basis. It would be wrong to say that the conceptualization of nature within the Indian worldview is constructed uh, uh, is constructed, is socially demarcated, is an imagined space when you look at everyday practices. It's such an everyday thing. It's not something special. It's not like you go around looking for nature worship and they say, this is nature, let's worship. It's so embedded in everyday life that you kind of have to look for it and understand it as a natural practice. You cannot um, look at a practice and say, oh, this is particularly pro-environmental behavior. You have to look for the everyday practice and see what's environmental about it. So that, that is one of the problems when you look at nature and Indian thought, particularly embedded in its cultural forms. Um, uh, uh, Nagarajan, uh, Vijaya Retukuri Nagarajan, actually adds that um, this calls it as embedded ecology. She says that uh, subtle and complex relationships between cu cultural and natural worlds exist in Indian thought. When I'm talking about the idea of landscape or nature, I'm talking about human beings subjectively seeking order in the universe through conceptualizations of nature as landscape. Here I'm not referring to the landscape post-enlightenment where you had a particular view of landscape, a response to poetry or drawing or painting, but I'm talking about geographical features as landscape in a more loose sense, uh, located geography. They're, they're mapped on a map, and they are rivers, forests, mountains, beaches, stony outcrops, uh, trees, groves, icicles. <coughs> all these are all sacred places in the Indian subcontinent. The relationship of people to landscape is articulated in terms of functions, in terms of resources, in terms of experiences, in terms of narratives, as well as seasonal practices. Yifu Thuang, who, if you would know, is a very good scholar in place studies, says that sacred places are locations of heliophany. He points out that places acquire a sacred character when a significant event takes place, some divine event takes place. In India, what we see is nature is not perceived as non-human and separate from human. It is perceived from a deeply humanized view. What do I mean by that? The human, it's not that na uh, the human is non-human. It's that even nature is humanized. Even nature is not uh, anthropocentric, not given personality, but it is the same as a human being. So you, you are looking at it from a humanized perspective. And explanations to account for sacredness of landscape are given by human narratives. And for them, these human narratives are true. There are no natural separate natural narratives. You must always remember that given our usual way to separate human and non-human, 
uh, given the differences, it's very difficult for us to imagine a culture where nature and human are embedded into the same tangle of life. But in Indian thought, it is very important for us to understand that these two are not separate and thereby you cannot give a special uh, status to either the non-human or the human. They're all entangled with each other into what we call the web of life. Uh, what's the advantage of such a sacred landscape uh, narrative? Inside a worldview of such a culture, one can see that there is the advantage of not having to work through a relationship with a passive, inanimate, other than human nature. Uh, in order to extend an ethical stand towards nature, we are always hunting for what David Abraham refers to as a common ground, a common medium through which a mutual exchange, exchange can unfold, he says. This common ground, according to me, in Indian thought, is a pre-existing relationship between human beings and nature through nature, through the idea of nature, sacred. However, is this idea such an easy word-to-world -word fit? Can we really find um, that uh, if nature is sacred in Hindu cosmology and culture, would our cultural reverence of nature uh, result in any ethical framework for actions and protect the earth from further destruction? Uh, will it help, for example, I'm not worried about whether America or Europe is going to take Indian thought and make their world sacred, but I'm looking at Indians looking at their own world and making it sacred and preserving their own environment. Will it culturally be important for Indians to look at their environment as sacred? Will it actually help? There have been a number of writings on sacred nature in India, which have a prolific, when I started my PhD, there was a prolific number of essays, and most of them are, sorry to say, a little bit romantic in nature. They kind of say, oh, Indians really are these kind of naive people who looked at, they wrote these Vedas, they looked at this beautiful moon and the beautiful mountains and sang of them. There's a kind of a naive feeling of natives respecting nature, which has been prevalent in Indian thought. And a lot of people buy into this kind of Indians love nature. And uh, so uh, that's where the topic of today's uh, I mean, title series plays importance, because we need to think critically about whether this is actually true. And my work today is not going to be telling you about how great nature is, but what are, I'm going to unpack the idea of the sacred and Indian thought and talk to you about the problems with this. Look at the idea of sacred and Indian thought. Um, first of all, there are sacred objects. Among objects related to the practice of sacred nature worship or reverence, we must distinguish between natural objects general geographical features, and particularly named landscape. Certain objects, plants, animals, and features are regarded as sacred categories, such as the holy vessel, right? The saligram. The saligram is a peculiar kind of a stone. It's actually a fossil, but it's considered to be a, a, Shiv, a, a Vishnu stone, a stone of uh, a god. Uh, there is also the Brahma Kamal, which is a sacred flower uh, imbued with magical properties of, uh, you know, immortality and curing all diseases. So there are all these sacred uh, flowers and plants. The holy cow. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, let's look at the holy fig tree, for instance, Picus religiosa, or rivers that are flowing eastwards. The river which is normally flowing is sacred, but the river that's particularly flowing in the eastward direction Paschima Vahini, it's called this, is supposed to be very, very uh, sacred, okay? Um, rivers that are flowing against their origin, that the, if they take a U-turn, that part of the river is supposed to be very, very sacred, more sacred than the rest of the river. So the sacredness of these objects is given by the fact that they are sacred types and tokens. They're considered some sort of sacred universals. So wherever the Tulsi is found, even if there's a little holy vessel in Canada, it will still be holy. It's not location specific. It's universal. Um, there was a there was one uh, pundit who I met who went to this uh, famous valley in England. I forget where it is. Where there were, there were these fossil rocks are easily found on the lakes, and he said that it's full of Vishnu because every fossil was a saligrama for him, and he said it's full of these rocks, so it must be the holy.